Hebrews now for a number of weeks, but uh, we're going to pick up uh, somewhat where we left off last week in Hebrews uh, 11, and I'm going to begin about verse 11 uh, in that uh, neighborhood, and uh, we will see what's uh, going on with this uh, issue of faith, which is the substance, the undergirding, that is, of uh, things hoped for, the evidence, uh, exhibit A, of things unseen, according to verse 1, and uh, the elders, it was testified of them that they had faith. And then he begins, you remember, in verse uh, 4, talking about some of those elders like Abel and Enoch and Noah that we have looked at. And uh, we'll pick up uh, uh, right there with Abraham. And let's have a word of prayer for uh, the beginning of our Bible study here. Heavenly Father, we're grateful today to be able to come into your word and for the encouragement that it's going to give us and the uh, education that we'll have as well. And we pray that when we leave here, we would be uh, people who uh, rightly divide the word of truth and understand it, are able to apply it in our lives and use it in our lives, and that it would be a, a, a strength for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, with that, we have by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. That's the uh, theme of Hebrews chapter 11. And we come to uh, Abraham and Sarah. I, I mentioned some of this last week, so just a little bit of review here, but uh, I want to pick up with some that I didn't pick up on. But he says in verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he, he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Um, Reminds me of Bob, who's up here this weekend looking for property so they can move from that godforsaken Sodom called Albuquerque and live in, live in northern New Mexico where they can go to church here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so uh, Abraham gets up and moves, and, and Linda's not with him, so I guess she's going with her she not, uh, knows not. Uh, but, uh, nonetheless, uh, here, here he, he obeys, and how did he obey? By faith, he obeyed. Uh, I want to uh, just uh, add a little something right here that is true for all of these, that uh, we need to be careful not to, uh, not to jump to the conclusion that it is only faith that matters. Uh, faith does matter, and that's the, that's the point of this uh, the chapter 11. But sometimes I think we uh, simplify it too much or reduce it too much and say, well, it's just all about faith. Uh, but these men and women that are mentioned in chapter 11, uh, by faith, they did something. And uh, what if they hadn't done anything? Well, it would have uh, uh, perhaps given us indication there was no faith there. Uh, certainly, if you don't follow through on it, then uh, there's, there's something, whether it's lack of faith or whatever it is. But uh, there was an obedience here. In fact, the overall purpose of Hebrews chapter 11 is to encourage the Hebrew nation to do what they need to do. And even though they don't see their Messiah reigning on the throne, they should trust that they have a Messiah who's going to reign on the throne. And he spent 10 chapters saying, I know he's dead. I know you killed him. I know all this, uh, but that's what was supposed to happen. And so by faith, keep going. Don't give up here. And so he's giving uh, these examples and he's going to come to the end and uh, he's going to say, now, if all those people acted did something by faith, then you too need to take your faith and go out and uh, carry it out. So here's Abraham, and he goes to this place. Now, verse 9, by faith he sojourned in a land of promise. That was the land he went to, by the way. So he sojourned. It never was his. Uh, he was a stranger there in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We talked of those last week. Now I want to pick up on verse 11. Also, Sarah herself re received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful 
who had promised. Now, the beginning of this verse is sort of in the, uh, shall we say, the passive tense, uh, that it was through faith that Sarah received strength, but she didn't really do anything. Uh, God just uh, did uh, the work there. And yet, towards the end, it changes that to the active sense, because she judged him faithful who had promised. So because she judged him faithful, God comes and uh, carries out uh, his work through her. Now, There's uh, a couple of things I want to say about uh, this uh, particular incident and Sarah itself and the way that we judge others. Uh, And we'll get to it later on when we uh, get, uh, assuming we get this far in the passage, uh, Barak and Samson and Jephthah are going to, we're going to put into the same category. But I think you and I, when we think of Sarah, we sometimes judge her somewhat harshly. Because remember when the three men came and said that uh, she was going to conceive and, uh, and Sarah was there listening outside the tent, they were telling Abraham, and uh, Sarah did what? She laughed. Thus, the boy's name is Isaac, which means laughter. Yes, some of you graduated from uh, fourth grade Sunday school. Very good. Uh, <laughs> so she laughed. The boy's name is laughter then. Uh, so... You know, we we get pretty hard on her. She didn't sound like or look like or give any appearance of being a woman of faith at that point, did she? Uh, In in fact, you might say she's more a woman of scoffing than she is faith. In fact, uh, someday perhaps we'll dig into the passage a little deeper. But those three people there, two of them are angels and one of them is the angel of the Lord. And uh, there's a difference there, and I believe that the angel of the Lord is actually Jesus Christ. So here Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus in the form of the angel of the Lord, shows up at her tent, and she laughs at what he says. That doesn't sound full of faith, does it? And so our judgment of her can be rather negative uh, based upon that one story. The problem is that's not the whole story, is it? And the whole story, we're given, I guess, uh, the conclusion of it right here, that she judged him faithful who had promised. That day, I know she laughed, but somewhere along the way, she judged him faithful. And the bottom line uh, uh, evaluation that the Bible gives of Sarah is she's a woman of faith. I think that ought to encourage you just a little bit, uh, shouldn't it? If you have ever uh, laughed at uh, something that God had said or promised, or uh, you, uh, can we just say, uh, you were more skeptical than you were faithful, and uh, we could judge you based upon that little incident, or we can look and say, let's take the whole look at uh, this person's life. And uh, this will show up even more, I think, with Barak and, and Samson and Jephthah in a little bit. Uh, let's just say, I wonder what God's evaluation is of her or of him. And God, let's see, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And uh, here's Sarah, who uh, is uh, laughing and uh, I don't I didn't go back to the passage in Genesis to see if it explicitly says anything but you know we it, it may be and again question the assumption on this because I may be wrong it may be that we judge her laughter as skepticism when all the scripture says is she laughed uh, and I don't know about you but if you're uh, how old was she uh, 75 85 90 uh, she's past childbearing years, as the scripture is about to say, you would probably laugh too, wouldn't you? Uh, and, uh, and Abraham would probably cry. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe it doesn't really have anything to do with lack of faith. Uh, but certainly, overall, her life was, uh, was one that was declared to be one who judged him faithful, who had promised. In verse 12, therefore, Uh, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in the multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Now, uh, that uh, one who is as good as dead, that uh, appears to be a little bit right here a reference to Sarah, although, and it it could be here, but uh, in other places of the scripture, it is uh, given to us as a reference to Abraham. Uh, Here's Abraham at his age, uh, he is as good as dead. Therefore sprang there uh, one even as good as dead. As many as the stars of the sky and the multitude and the sands which by the seashore are by the seashore innumerable. Now that in and of itself is a little bit of a statement of faith by the writer of the book of Hebrews, isn't it? Because uh, 
the Jewish people at that point were far outnumbered by the Roman people, weren't they? Uh, in fact, today, does anyone know how many Jews there are in the world? Uh, about 12 million, which means that um, there's, there's a lot more of everybody else, right? <laughs> Uh, in fact, I understand that uh, 12 million is within the margin of error of the uh, estimated population of China. So that's, that's kind of a slim, uh, a slim number. You think about that, you wonder, why in the world does a people group of 12 million have such uh, uh, influence and on the other side receive such animosity in the world? Uh, I, I know that you could find other people groups of that, uh, of that number. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Texans are maybe the closest. Uh, there's about 20 million of them, and they have a lot of influence and a lot of animosity uh, toward them. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but here's the Jewish people just with a very slim population. And yet, if you uh, Google today what are the major religions of the world, five major religions of the world, Judaism is always going to come up there. How do you get this is a major religion when probably, I'm not sure, but probably there are more Mormons than there are, uh, are Jews. Uh, and yet here is this major religion of this little sliver of people. Now, all of that, uh, I, I think the reason that they have this influence and animosity is, of course, because they're the chosen people and God has a work for them, and the devil doesn't like that, and the, and the world uh, needs that, and all these uh, things that go into that. But uh, nonetheless, it's, it's hard still to say that they're, uh, they're, they're innumerable. Uh, they're, they're probably more numerable, uh, more, more easily numbered is what I want to say. They're probably more easily numbered than a lot of other uh, people groups uh, in the world. It's probably easier to count the Jews than it is to figure out how many people live in Taos, right? Uh, so uh, this in and of itself is this little statement of uh, faith that uh, comes through there. Uh, so uh, here it, it uh, does say in verse 11 that uh, she... Uh, she, she delivered this child past age. That is a miraculous uh, conception, that here's a woman past uh, childbearing age. You can look at it in Genesis, you can look at it here, you can look at it in the other places it's mentioned, and every time it tells us this woman can't bear children, and yet she's bearing children. So, it is miraculous. Now, we don't need to uh, have any need to put it in the same sense of the uh, miraculous conception that Jesus had, because, of course, that was miraculous also, but the difference was, in Jesus, there was no earthly father. Here, we have an earthly father. It's just that she's past childbearing years, and, uh, and yet she bears the child uh, nonetheless and uh, delivers this child. And the other person, of course, there were three miraculous uh, births, maybe, maybe, maybe four, uh, in the uh, Bible. Uh, and those were in addition to Sarah and Jesus. Who else? Elizabeth, John's, uh, J John the Baptist's mother, that's right, Zachariah's wife. And then the other, the other maybes, I'd have to dig into Scripture to look into it. Hannah, the, uh, the, the mother of Samuel, uh, the, and uh, the question there is, it, it doesn't appear from the text anyway that Hannah is beyond childbearing years, it's just that she had not born any children yet, and uh, the unfortunate fact for her was uh, Elkanah, her husband, his other wife was Paniah, you remember, and Paniah was uh, fertile as the Jordan Valley. Uh, and it was causing some uh, challenges there in the home. So Hannah, we could maybe put in there. I think of one other, and I forget her name, but I know her son, who had long hair. Samson's mother, uh, and, and uh, there was a miraculous visitation that took place, and, uh, and uh, that issue there. Again, we'd have to look into that again and see what uh, miracle is there. But nonetheless, this certainly was a uh, miraculous conception that was taking place. Uh, by the way, there is among the uh, Catholics a doctrine called the Immaculate Conception. Uh, 
And we sometimes, when we don't understand that, we might say, well, yes, I believe in the Immaculate Conception, thinking that we're saying I believe in the virgin birth. And we do believe in the virgin birth. The problem is the Immaculate Conception really does not have anything to do with the conception of Jesus. The Immaculate Conception in Catholic theology has to do with the conception of Mary uh, by her mother and father, uh, whom they say is uh, Anna and uh, Jacobed, perhaps. Uh, I know uh, Anne or Saint Anne. Anna is the uh, is is the mother of Mary, suppose in in tradition. Uh, so immaculate conception is not the same as virgin birth. We believe in the virgin birth. We don't believe in the immaculate conception, uh, as uh, as as evangelicals anyway. So uh, here we go. You ready to come back to the Sunday school lesson now? Uh, again in uh, verse. Let's pick up in verse th thirteen. These all died. Who, who are these? Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, uh, perhaps uh, even Isaac that we'll look at in a moment. But these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Here is this uh, beautiful little uh, word of encouragement, I guess, of uh, these who uh, they all died really not receiving the promises. They were told the promises, but hadn't received the promises, especially the promise of having that land, having that kingdom, having this immeasurable people, uh, and uh, they died without it. And uh, what he's, again, encouraging the Hebrew people is, uh, is to say, you know what, I, uh, I recognize that, uh, that the Messiah you're expecting hasn't set up his kingdom yet, but don't lose faith because of that. You've got a whole heritage of people who died in faith, not having received the promises, and you didn't discount those promises, so don't discount this promise either, that, uh, that God is going to send his Messiah to set up his kingdom. These all died in faith, uh, not having received the promises. Now, there are five uh, participles in this uh, particular verse. And uh, here is uh, the first one, uh, having received or not having received the promises. Uh, second one is having seen them from far off. A participle in basically in English means it ends in ing, by the way. Uh, but only three of them are, are presented as participles in the English translation. Uh, and I want to look at those last three. It says, they were persuaded of them. Literally, it says, having been persuaded of them. Now, I like that a little better because especially as I think of Sarah, let's assume that she was faithless when she laughed, and yet by the end, she's judged a person of faith. So what happened? Somewhere along the way, she was persuaded, right? And now she is having been persuaded. Uh, I think that, uh, first of all, that uh, probably describes you too. Uh, were any of you ever... Uh, skeptical about something the Bible says, and yet now you're persuaded of it. Uh, I, as you, uh, many of you know my story, I grew up in a Christian home and uh, had, had uh, the privilege, I would say, of, uh, uh, of having both a family and a demeanor that caused me to accept the Lord Jesus at an early age and to, to be persuaded about the Lord Jesus Christ and to become a person of faith. But there are some other things in the scripture of which I was not persuaded until later. Uh, for example, a pre-tribulation rapture. I've given you that story before that uh, I didn't believe we were going to be raptured out of here uh, prior to the tribulation. I thought that was wishful thinking. And I just couldn't see it in scripture. Uh, then, then, uh, then later I studied scripture and said, well, golly. <laughs> It does say that, doesn't it, when you put it all together. So now I stand here having been persuaded. Have you noticed even in your life the things which you once did not believe but now you believe? You believe stronger than things you just sort of always, uh, the things you had to wrestle with and struggle with and uh, work through, that's where you are. So these that are mentioned are those, it says, having been persuaded. I do like the uh, word persuaded too, and I want to give you some Greek today so you don't feel cheated. Uh, the... the uh, the word is uh, 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 pie piezo, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, piezo, uh, persuaded, and uh, the opposite of piezo would put, if you, in Greek, of course, if you put the A in front of it, it cancels it out, so a piezo. Uh, now, that's not where we get apathy, 
uh, apathy is apathos, and pathos is feeling or emotion. So a person with, uh, with apathy doesn't have any feeling or emotion, they don't care, right? Uh, but apietho is uh, the person has never been persuaded. Here's the word persuaded. Now, in the uh, scripture, uh, the word apietho is often, as we'll get down to verse 31, it's often uh, uh, translated as either unbelieving, which is a better translation, or as New American Standard usually does it, they'll say disobedient. And it's only disobedient by interpretation or by degree, because if you're not persuaded, then you're not going to follow through, right? And so you become disobedient. Uh, if uh, you uh, are not persuaded that the U.S. government has uh, ability to, uh, um, you know, force you to uh, whatever, have... Uh, uh, get rid of your incandesc incandescent light bulbs, uh, <laughs> then you keep on using incandescent light bulbs because you're not persuaded that's of their authority, so you're disobedient to the executive order or whatever it may be. Uh, so it's by degree or by, separate, by, by interpretation that you are disobedient, but the, the heart of the matter is not persuaded. Well, here's some who having been persuaded. I don't know all their story, uh, and I wish I did. I'd love to get into the uh, writer's mind or God's mind here and say, now tell me how, how Abel had to be persuaded. Uh, but he's having been persuaded. And uh, here he is. I don't know if it was an easy argument with Abel or a difficult argument with Abel. All I know is he's persuaded now, having been persuaded. Uh, and then going on in verse 13, uh, they were having, or the, the, they were persuaded, or literally they, they are having been persuaded. That's not good English, it's just good Greek. Uh, it says, and embraced them. Literally, and having embraced them, the them there is the promises. So, they have been persuaded they have now been persuaded. They have embraced those promises. Uh, the word there is aspasomai. Uh, and uh, often it's uh, just translated as saluted or greeted, welcomed in, in a sense. Uh, and so uh, we'll see the word later when we get to chapter 13, verse 24. It says, uh, you know, I, I, I have saluted or I salute so-and-so, and it lists some names there. I greet, I welcome is the uh, word there. And so here they were, they having been persuaded, then they welcome them. Again, think of Sarah. At first she laughed, if we're reading the story correctly. At first she laughed, but then somewhere along the way she became persuaded and having been persuaded then she greeted the promises that were coming she welcomed the promises that were uh, coming and uh, uh, brought that uh, greeting by the way uh, in case uh, you want a, a little footnote in history Aspasia was is uh, the most famous woman in Athenian history Athens uh, so that you feel really smart and uh, high-heeled today when you go out. You can say, I was thinking of Athasius uh, just uh, the other day, you know, the most prominent woman of Greek history uh, <laughs> in Athens, and she was the wife of uh, Pericles, one of the uh, famous uh, politicians, and uh, whether her name was Aspasia or she just became Aspasius, uh, she was very welcoming, she had parties. She was the Dolly Madison, right? the Dolly Madison of Athenian history. And of course, Dolly Madison in your American history was the one who made uh, Twinkies. Uh, and uh, welcomed a lot of people into the White House with, or cupcakes or something of that nature. Uh, <laughs> Aspasia. Uh, so, having been persuaded, having greeted or welcomed or embraced, uh, and then confessed, that is, having confessed. Uh, the word confessed, I didn't put it on your outline, but it is the word homo legeo, and of course homo means the same, and lo logos, legeo, means to speak. Uh, to say the same thing is literally what it says, and a confession is to say the same thing. Uh, you, you know, are, are you the one that, uh, you know, ate the last piece of pie? I'm the one that ate the last piece of pie. What is that? It's a confession, isn't it? I'm saying the same thing. Homo legale. So they came and they said the same thing. So finally Sarah comes and says, 
I'm going to have a child past my childbearing years, and God's going to use that to fulfill his promise. And she, uh, she confesses this, or speaks the same thing. And uh, so all of these, having received the promises, having seen them from afar off, having been persuaded, having greeted or welcomed or embraced them, having then confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth, uh, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, uh, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared them a city. And of course, this is speaking of the city of God or the, the coming kingdom that he's so much trying to get the Hebrew people not to give up on. Uh, so verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him, that is, raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, what in the world does uh, this mean? First of all, uh, you could uh, uh, compare, uh, we won't go there, but verse 19 talks about uh, how God was able to raise him up, accounting how God was able to raise him up. And if you uh, want to reference uh, later on this afternoon in your four or five hours Bible study, you can look to Romans chapter uh, 4, verses 17 through 22. And there's a little deeper account here of how Abraham believed that God was going to raise up Isaac from the dead. And so when he takes him to the, uh, to the altar and he's ready to sacrifice him, thinking, well, how in the world is God going to fulfill his promises? Well, he's been persuaded. He's greeted these. He is uh, all these things we just said. He's embraced these promises. And so he knows God's going to do it. And so he's willing even to sacrifice the son through whom God is going to do it because he believes God is going to raise him up from the dead. And so uh, he says then that he believed that, uh, uh, let's see, in verse 19, uh, whence he also received him in a figure. Uh, so it calls Isaac a figure. Now, uh, the Greek word for figure is parabole. And, of course, we get our English word parable from parabole. And uh, a parable is a parabole, but what is a parabole, right? Uh, and it comes from the Greek uh, words para, which means to come alongside, that's right. Uh, as I've said a million times, a paramedic comes alongside a, a doctor, a paralegal comes beside a, a lawyer. So here is a, uh, a parabole. Where, well, bole is the Greek word for actually to throw something or to cast something, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to strongly put something somewhere. Uh, and uh, throw would be the best. In fact, we get our English word ball uh, from, from that because what do you do with a ball? You throw it. That's right. So uh, uh, here's the, uh, we, we, we didn't have a word for it, so we just called it in Greek the throw thing. Ball. <laughs> That's the throw thing. So parabole is to come alongside something you have, uh, you, you've thrown. Now, in this sense, something you've thrown into a certain spot, uh, something's been thrown into a, a, a certain spot, or to throw something into a spot uh, alongside another. It's a comparison kind of uh, word that is, uh, that is given here. And uh, to, to uh, throw two things side by side in a comparison. Come alongside and uh, put a comparison. So what the writer here says is, hey, you should stop for a minute because Isaac was a figure. And it was a parable. And he was a figure or a parable of whom? Jesus Christ. So he's saying... Uh, what, what, it, what I think he's saying, I'm going to put words in his mouth. He's saying, I'm not going to stop to give you the comparison, but you ought to look at the comparison between Isaac and Christ. Isaac is not Christ. He's a figurable of Christ. He's the one you ought to compare. And you begin to uh, look at, at him, and you see things like both of them had a miraculous birth, didn't they? It was a different kind of birth, but we've already seen Sarah's birth uh, of Isaac or conception of Isaac was miraculous, and so is that of Jesus. Uh, both of them 
were sacrificed by their father, right? Uh, God, it says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased God to crush him. Well, you could look at uh, Abraham's story, and in a, in, a, in a sense, we don't understand it on either, uh, either matter, but it pleased I, uh, Abraham to be obedient. Son, why did it please uh, Isaac lived to tell about his experience? Must have been quite the story, didn't it? Uh, wasn't it? And, uh, you know, Isaac was not, don't, don't think of him as a little baby that couldn't remember it. Isaac was old enough as they're going up to say, hey, uh, we're going for the sacrifice and we've got the wood and we've got the fire, but we don't have an animal. Uh, where's, the, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Oh, God will provide. God will provide. And uh, imagine uh, that made a great story for the grandkids, by the way. Uh, you think you got it bad. Let me tell you what my dad did to me. <laughs> uh, and so Isaac lived to tell about it. Well, Jesus lived to tell about it in a different way. Isaac was, was resurrected in the sense that he was spared and was able to get up off the altar and see the ultimate sacrifice or the sacrifice that God would provide for that day, which uh, then we get into an ultimate. You know, I, I think there's one reason that this scripture doesn't say Isaac is a type, but it says Isaac is a parable. And that is types, you remember, all of the details have to carry all the way through. And for Isaac, it's only a comparison because Isaac didn't die. The NSB says, says type, incorrectly so, which is why everyone should have a King James Version. Uh, <laughs> that and two other hours I could speak on it, but uh, uh, for my normally nas formerly NASB stained fingers. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the word here is parabola. And, and uh, they, there is a Greek word for type, it is tupos. And uh, tupos is a type, parabole is a comparison. Jesus says, uh, uh, what's a parable? I'm, uh, for some reason, all parables just left my mind. Uh, but uh, he speaks to them in parables. The kingdom of God is like, he says, uh, a man who had a field and there was a treasure and those. And, and so he says, this is a parable, a comparison that you can uh, give of it. And that is uh, exactly how, uh, how the scripture is. Now picking up uh, in verse 20, it says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Um, I, I wish, uh, again, we had a little more time, but we'll never get through Hebrews 11 if I don't hurry. Uh, but uh, again, this afternoon, when you go study, look at Genesis 27, verses 27 through 29, and you'll see this blessing that he gives uh, to Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Uh, that tells us that this is not just a blessing of Jacob and Esau concerning their lives, but it is a prophetic blessing, if you will. Verse uh, 31, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. Uh, we have uh, the interesting uh, little account here of Jacob, the grandson of, uh, uh, of Abraham, blessing the two sons of Joseph. And of course, the two sons of Joseph were named Ephraim and Manasseh, that's right. And uh, he blessed uh, both of them and some interesting things of which I don't uh, I understand all of it. Uh, Manasseh received the greater blessing, though Manasseh was the younger son. And uh, uh, other than uh, to it than that. Uh, but one of the things he does, you know, sometimes we call the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, we'll call them not tribes, but half-tribes. And I think this is really uh, not accurate because if you look through the tribes of, uh, of, of uh, Israel, first of all, no place in the Bible are they called half-tribes. That's what, that's what we call them. Uh, and they get their own portion of land, just like all the others do. They get their own inheritance, just like all the others do. And if you read the account of this blessing, which is uh, given in Genesis chapter 48, 5, really what Jacob does here is adopt Ephraim and Manasseh as his own sons. He says, Ephraim and Manasseh will be the same to me as Reuben and Simeon. Now, we never call Reuben and Simeon half-tribes, do we? Uh, so... What, he's, what he says is, Joseph, you're going to get a double portion 
because Ephraim and Manasseh are both going to be considered my sons. So rather than me get, dividing, you know, by so, so much and giving uh, this to you and you having divided up to, uh, between your sons, he says, both of your sons are going to get the same kind of thing that, that Reuben would get, that Simeon would get. They are now my sons. And so they're very legitimately within the, uh, the, the tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh. They're not sort of step tribes or half tribes. Uh, they are uh, equally uh, tribes with Reuben and Simeon. Uh, they are adopted unto him. And of course, there is no tribe of Joseph. Uh, so, by the way, in that same passage, Genesis 48, uh, 22, by, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Made mention of the departing of Israel. That is, here Joseph dies, and of course, he dies where? In Egypt. Uh, and all of the uh, descendants of Abraham are now living in Egypt. And when Joseph dies, he says, our people are going back someday. And when they go back, I want you to take my bones. I want to be buried there, not here. And so he has a faith of what uh, God is going to do out there into the future. That's a, uh, that's a pretty big leap of faith, isn't it? Uh, if in any other account, 70 people... Uh, due to famine, move off to some other country, chances are they're never going back, right? Uh, and this is what happened. You've got 75 uh, altogether people that end up in Egypt, and yet Joseph knows they're going back. This is a temporary kind of thing because how does he know they're going back? God has promised that land to them, not this land. There are things that uh, we, can, we can take and we can do them uh, with faith. Let me give you an example. Uh, I hear from time to time, fairly common, how uh, American and European society, I got to figure out a kind of a nice way to say this that doesn't sound racist because I don't mean any of it racist at all. American and European society, which basically we would call uh, the uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon kind of uh, society. We hear uh, how it is going to uh, die out because we're not having enough babies. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, say Middle Easterners are having lots of babies, and demographically we have a, ha have a problem. And you can read articles about how Europe is dead and there's no hope for it in the future, simply by demographics. And I saw one the other day, too, said the same thing, America is dead and has no future. Now, uh, anyone of a, of a uh, Latin or European uh, kind of uh, descendancy uh, is a, uh, ultimately a descendant of Japheth from uh, Noah. And of course, there's Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Shem, of course, the Shemitic people, uh, Middle Easterners, Ham, uh, which would be uh, the Afri Indo-African uh, peoples, and then Japheth, the uh, Latin, the Anglo, the Saxon, all those, uh, are descendants of Japheth. So they say, you know, basically the descendants of Japheth uh, are are doomed because they're not having enough babies. And I say, no, wait a minute, they're not having enough babies right now, and uh, that could be a problem for their way of thinking or their way of life, but the Bible says, I will enlarge the tents of Japheth. Uh, and it speaks about the, the, uh, the, the power, if you will, of Japheth. So ultimately, I say, Ah, it's today's demographics. You know, it goes with tomorrow's newspaper. I mean, it's all going to come and go and come and go. And so you have to take a long look. That's having a biblical worldview. And the only way you can have a biblical worldview is know the Bible. <laughs> That's right. You've got to know what the Bible says in order to have a biblical worldview. And that will keep you from getting uh, unduly worried about uh, some, uh, some matters and some circumstances. So, uh Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Now, uh, if you read this in the Greek, it's very clear that the faith is Moses' parents. Uh, here in English, it almost looks like faith. Moses had the faith, but obviously he's just a little baby. Um, 
and because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. I wish I had um, more time. I guess I'll take it next week. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I had planned uh, one, maybe two weeks on Hebrews chapter 11, and here I am in the third week and not going to finish. But proper child. Does anyone have a beautiful child? Okay. Uh, and actually beautiful is the uh, better translation here, I must admit. <laughs> uh, and yet, how many of you had an ugly baby? <laughs> Everybody, everybody's baby is beautiful, isn't it? So what is it about Moses we say, he's a beautiful child. Oh, what a beautiful baby. I mean, we all say that, he's a beautiful baby. And uh, yet here the Bible says he's a beautiful baby. And uh, when you actually get into that and trace it, which we're not going to do, what you see is, that this is God's evaluation of Moses. He's a beautiful baby. I'm going to spare him. But it's not, uh, not so much necessarily uh, that he is physically beautiful. Maybe he was. I don't know. Uh, but the issue is he's beautiful because he is the, uh, the redeemer of, uh, of Israel's people, in a sense. He's the one that's going to lead them out of their bondage into freedom. And uh, so... The scripture, again, three or four times you're going to find this, this uh, biblical uh, picture or, or a biblical description of Moses as a beautiful baby. And, uh, of course, uh, Jackson Graves is going to be born in September, uh, who will also be beautiful, no doubt, my grandson. Uh, and uh, yet I don't think there, God's going to add an extra chapter to the Bible to declare his beauty, uh, right? But here it is of Joseph, and you see it a number of uh, times in the Scripture, and every time you see it, really it is indication that God is, God is up to something here. God is behind this. God is uh, fulfilling a, a promise and a work here. Uh, verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's such a, a strong and encouraging mark, isn't it? Uh, when you're uh, tempted by sin for a season, that uh, there is uh, something bigger and better that God is up to. I am uh, strongly contemplating that on my Thursday night Bible study, uh, where I'll begin a new series in a few weeks, uh, our online Bible study, I'm contemplating... Uh, doing the uh, Song of Solomon, which I have never taught uh, all the way through and probably only preached one or two sermons out of it in which I took one little piece of scripture and then said whatever I wanted to. Uh, but I am considering actually preaching or teaching it exegetically saying, what in the world is this Song of Solomon all about? And I'm convinced it's about far more than, uh, th than romance. You read it on the surface as romance. Uh, but why do we need a romance novel in the Bible? You can buy those at the grocery store, right? Uh, this is far more than that. I think it's a figure, if you will. And uh, it's a figure not unlike this one, because in the, in the Song of Solomon, uh, you have this beautiful maiden who, you may not re remember, but in Song of Solomon, she is torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. <laughs> uh, that's an old hymn. We used to sing it when Rodney was here. Now that he's gone, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, she's got King, the King Solomon on the one hand, who is uh, saying, hey, you're beautiful, come to me. I've got everything I can provide for you. And then she's got this shepherd that she's fallen in love with. And uh, she's torn between the shepherd whom she loves and the king who can provide for her. Now, this is uh, Moses, if you will. And he's got the Pharaoh who can provide for him in every way and give him such a fantastic life. Or he's got these little slave people that uh, he's, a, he's a part of. What's he going to do? And he, it uh, says again in such a beautiful way, he refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And uh, uh, with that, I think it's a, just an encouragement. Uh, no, I've got to finish. Uh, uh, 
No, I don't have time to finish Moses. So we're going to pick up right there uh, in verse 26 with Moses when we uh, come together next week. In just a, a little bit, our service will start. and We'll have uh, some wonderful singing, not singing uh, Torn Between Two Lovers. Uh, who sang that originally, by the way? It was... It was actually a test to see if we had any sinners in the room, and obviously we don't. We're all perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly holy, uh, never having listened to secular music. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, let's see, now I forgot what I was saying. We're going to have some singing in, in a little bit. We're going to have some preaching. I'm going to preach about the day of Pentecost, so we'll have a good service. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. You can get a cup of coffee in between. <laughs> 